Well, if you have ever had a message from me before, you know that I get into trouble because of my accent quite frequently. Uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago when I was with you all, uh, I told an analogy about icebergs, <laughs> and uh, a lot of people thought I was saying ice bags. Uh, so this happens a lot, but I am not actually alone in the, uh, the dilemma of a British accent. Actually, even within England, there are so many accents within England that it's very easy to mishear someone. Uh, now, this morning we're talking about prayer, and I wanted to share a story about uh, a friend of my brother-in-law's who had kind of a mix-up of these two worlds of having an accent and being misunderstood in prayer. Uh, he was uh, on the prayer team for a church, and, and in particular in this story, uh, the church was holding an event uh, in which at the end of the service, uh, people were asked to come forward to, for prayer if they needed it. So my brother-in-law's friend, he was on the prayer team, he was up there at the front, uh, and people start coming forward uh, and asking for things. And of course, the prayer team is uh, praying however they can. And someone comes forward to my brother-in-law's friend. Uh, and this is my best impression of what it sounded like. It was a British accent. Uh, he said uh, that he would like prayer for bonus, right? Now, I don't know what you just heard when I said that. But my brother-in-law's friend had baldness. Right? So he thought to himself, surely, surely this, this guy is, is not asking me to pray for him to be bald. So let me ask him again. So he said, hey, I misheard you. Could, you. could you tell me again what you need prayer for? And he says, yeah, baldness. And so my brother-in-law's friend again thought, wow, that, that did sound like baldness. <laughs> and rather than tell this person that he didn't want to pray for him for baldness, he thought the respectful thing to do is to pray for what he asked for. So my brother-in-law's friend began praying for the baldness of this man. He was saying, Lord, would you unsheath his hair from his head? Lord, would you strip him of the head? Like, he began to pray for this, for baldness. Now, some, at some point after this prayer, this, this gentleman received it quite nicely, quietly, and then walked away. At some point... Someone who had overheard this conversation, I'm assuming, revealed to him that what this man was saying was boldness. Boldness. So my brother-in-law had had boldness. Now, as we begin to talk about what not to pray, I would encourage you, never assume that someone wants boldness. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good rule of thumb if you want to know what not to pray. Don't pray for boldness. Even if you hear from someone like me who has an accent, something that you think is like that, it's probably not that. So today we are talking about prayer, and we're talking about how not to pray. And last week, Jeff began sharing with us about praying with Jesus, and he said some statistics that I thought were very interesting. He said that 84% of people in the United States say that they pray. 84% of people across the spectrum, across all demographics and beliefs, they say that they pray. Even a third of atheists say that they pray which is more than a little awkward for atheists. But just about everybody says that they have a prayer life of some kind. Now, what's important for us as Christians is to understand what true biblical prayer is and separate that from what prayer is culturally. Because prayer can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But when we as Christians talk about prayer, we are talking about something very specific. We're talking about something that's laid out in the Bible for us by Jesus. There are ways that we should not pray, and Jesus, in this week's passage, is going to make clear, uh, clear to us that when we pray, there are certain things that we shouldn't do. So what is it that Jesus wants us to keep out of prayer? What is it that Jesus doesn't want us to do in prayer? Another thing that Pastor Jeff shared last week that I thought was very helpful was that he said that Christian prayer is not turning inward, it's turning upward. Christian prayer is really, at, at its very core, all about who God is. It's about looking to God. And so as we think about how not to pray, we want to keep in mind that what prayer should be is something that's focused on God. It's not about finding some sense of goodness or hope within ourselves. It's not about self-reflection or introspection. Prayer is about looking to God. It's a recognition that we need Him. That's the kind of prayer that Jesus modeled when he prayed. He prayed for his father because we needed him. 
Even Jesus needed his father. And so when Jesus talks to his disciples, he warns them about how not to pray. So we're going to look at three things that we can all of us often get wrong about what prayer is and how we should pray. We're going to look at having a wrong audience, a wrong understanding, and a wrong access. Would you go ahead and read with me? We're in Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. The first thing that Jesus brings us to is a wrong audience. Now, uh, I've often talked when I've, I've spoke here at South Street about uh, what I was like when I was in middle school, high school, and how different I was, and I've never brought a picture for you. So this week I thought I would bring a picture as I tell a story about this so that you could visualize who it is we're talking about. So this is me when I was around about 16. He is a good looking guy. Um, you can already see the baldness setting in on top, or can't you? Now, uh, when I was in middle school, I was very, very fixated on what people thought about me. If you're in middle school or high school now, if you're a student, uh, you know that that's one of the things we talk about in student ministry a lot, is we talk about others' perceptions of you, because it, it fills your mind all the time. What are others thinking about me? And middle school Andrew was completely fixated on what other people thought about him. And I quickly learned that if you wanted to be in with the right crowd of people, then the thing that you needed to be into was skating, right? Being a skateboarder. And so I bought a hoodie, and I bought baggy pants, and I bought a skateboard. Uh, and I think I've mentioned before I wore this dog chain on my uh, pants to try and fit in. Uh, because that's, that's how you dressed. That's what you did if you were in the skateboarding crew. Now, I never, I did, had no desire to actually really be a skateboarder. I just knew that that's what this certain crowd of people did. And I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to be in that crowd. So even though I had no love within my own heart for skateboarding, I would go and hang out with this crowd, I would dress like them, I would talk like them, I would be with them. I would spike what little hair I had up to be like them. And I would even watch skateboarding documentaries, and I would watch uh, with my friends these videos of people doing tricks on skateboards, and, and some of it was impressive, but for most of the documentary, I was just pretending that I liked it because it was really quite boring. Now. Jesus begins his conversation with us today about prayer, about how not to pray, talking about hypocrites. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. He's talking about people who are somewhat similar to middle school Andrew. People who present one part about themselves, but perhaps the inside truth of who that person is, is not the same. Jesus tells his disciples about people who love to pray on street corners and in synagogues, but he calls them hypocrites. Now what's wrong with that picture? People who love to pray in synagogues. So people who love to pray in church and people who love to pray on street corners in the midst of people. It's really easy to hear that and just to just kind of assume, well, these are the bad guys. Jesus is saying, don't be like this. And so, of course, that's a terrible thing. But how many of us, if someone asked us, what's a good place to pray would say in the church? Pray with your friends. There's, on, on the face of what is happening, These people aren't really doing anything wrong. These people are actually doing the the kind of things that we would associate with a good prayer life. They're praying in church. They're praying in the synagogue. They're praying with their friends and family outside of the church. So what is it about these people that make them hypocrites in Jesus' eyes? 
Hypocrite is, it actually comes from a Greek word that means actor or performer. So what Jesus is saying is these people are performers. He's saying what you don't realize about these people who pray on the street corners and pray in the synagogues and look like incredible people of prayer, what you don't realize is that it's all a performance. They have the wrong audience. These people are praying to the wrong audience. They're just putting on a show. This is not genuine love for prayer because what these people really want is they want to be seen by others. Their prayer isn't directed towards God. This is what the prophet Isaiah says about hypocrisy in his uh, writings. He says in Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord said, because this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Hypocrites and people who pray like hypocrites are people who have a divided focus. That what is on the outside isn't necessarily re reflecting what's going on within them. Now it would be easy at this point to think of these hypocrites as a them. These, these are these people over here that they don't pray to God. They don't honor God. That's them over there. And we don't read these words that Jesus is sharing as a possibility for ourselves. Perhaps I shouldn't read that unto you, but that's certainly how I read it. When I read this, my mind likes to think of the hypocrites as these people over there. He's probably not talking about me. But the truth is, actually, he could very well be talking about me. Jesus could be addressing that in me because hypocrisy is something that lurks within all of us. All of us attempted at various places in our life to present a certain perception of ourselves. Live a certain way, just like middle school Andrew, to get the attention of others, the love of others, the approval of others, we present certain things about ourselves that may not be accurate. How many of us put on a, a, a smiley face when things are really hard in our lives? How many of us try to create an image of who we are to everyone who's looking at us. Jesus' solution says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus says, go into a room and speak to your Father. Go away from prying eyes, from the attention of others, and pray to your Father. Now, what Jesus is not doing is he's not condemning public prayer. He's not condemning praying in front of other people. We know that that can't be the case because Jesus would pray in front of other people. So there can't be anything inherently wrong in, in, in praying in public. It's not that private prayer is the only way to pray. In fact, quite the contrary, it can be a deeply encouraging and, and wonderful thing when you pray in public. What Jesus is trying to get people to see is that one group of people want to be seen by others. They want the attention of others. And this other second group that he talks about, this person who goes into their room, they're going where only the Father can see. They want the attention of the Father. They want the eyes of the Father. That's the difference between these two groups of people, who their audience is. Here's the way that Jesus puts it. He says, where are you seeking your reward? He says, these people who stand on the street corners, they've received their reward because they wanted to be seen by others. So there it is. But when you go into your room and pray in secret, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Have you ever had a friend share something tough that they're going through and you attempted to say, I'll be praying for you. I'm going to pray about that. And then you forget to. I have. I, it's one of the things that I get most frustrated with myself about is I'm, I'm so tempted to regularly say for people, I'm praying for you, I'll pray for that. And then I don't. And do you know why I think, for me, that happens? is because I really sometimes care too much about what other people think about me than what God thinks. I want people to think that I'm praying for them, that I'm a praying kind of person, instead of actually thinking about, well, should I just stop right now and pray? 
because that's what, that's what matters. Some of the most incredible prayers on this earth are invisible because they're not publicized, because they're not paraded. And again, it's not the public prayer is bad. Some of the most incredible prayers I've received for me in my life have been shared in public. But those people that pray for me that deeply affect me the most, I can tell that when they pray, they're not praying for my attention. They're praying for their fathers. They're not praying so that I would see them. They're praying because they know that their father does see them. Now, there's the other end of the spectrum on these kind of people as well. People who are afraid to pray in public. And this is actually the same problem. Most of the time when we're afraid to pray in public, it's because we are afraid of what people will think of us. Maybe they'll think our prayers aren't eloquent enough, or they're not <laughs> Christian enough, or they're not put together enough. But can I free you up this morning? Because what Jesus is saying, is he's saying it doesn't matter what other people think of your prayers. Your father sees them and listens to them. Whether you are someone who is completely fixated on others' perception of yourself or someone who's afraid of others' perception of you, in both cases, you can be freed up by coming to your God who sees in secret and listens to you, who is the better audience for your prayer. He is the better audience for your prayers. And the second thing that Jesus brings up is a wrong understanding. Have you uh, ever been called on your cell phone by uh, the telesales companies who call you up to, to sell you something? My wife does not like when I get calls from these people because I cannot say no. Uh, one of the telecalls that we get the most is from our old university, Baylor University in Texas. Uh, they will regularly call up because it's a private school for donations. Are you willing to donate to these scholarships and things. And usually what happens is they call, uh, and you can tell that they kind of have a script with me, right? Like they're reading these lines from a script, but I, I buy into it every time. And my wife is listening to me, having this conversation. She said, just hang up, just put it down. Don't like fall for their script. Because I'm saying, would you be able to donate this amount? You know, how's your family doing? How is, you know, we see here that you completed your degree in biblical studies, how's that going? And I'm just like, oh, it's going quite well, thank you. And I'm, because I, I get sucked into these scripts, right? This way of talking. Now, really what's happening in all telecalls, and I, and I know this because I've worked in this industry, is these people have a script and they just babble at you. They don't really care about what's going on. They are trying to get an agenda through. They have a goal in mind. And when they call you, no matter how authentic they sound, Really what's happening is that they are saying certain things to elicit certain responses from you, right? And I, they get it really well with me, which is why I'm not allowed to take their calls. <laughs> but some of us tend to treat prayer that way as well. Jesus says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus' second word of advice to his disciples is don't get caught up in the words that you use. Don't get lost in that. Do you think that God hears your prayers because you use the right words? Are you like a telesales person who is trying to read through a script because you want to get a certain response from God? Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles. This is a common phrase in Jesus' day for pagans, for people who are non-Jewish. It's a way of thinking of other religious thinkers. And what Jesus is saying is, there's a certain way that they think about God and gods and religion that I don't want you to think. There's a certain way that they view God and praying to their gods that you need to get away from. He says that they heap up empty phrases and he actually uses this word that means to, to babble, right? It's, it's kind of funny in my mind that Jesus says that these people just babble, babble, babble. They give vain repetitions. And in the religious world that Jesus lived in, people were consumed about how to get their God's approval. How can I say just the right things and, and relate to God in just the right way to get a certain response from him, right? It's really about manipulation, 
How can I have the right mantra or incantation to win the God's favor? And what Jesus is saying is don't be like that. Don't think that God enjoys that. Don't have a wrong understanding of prayer. Don't make the mistake of thinking that your father in heaven is like these pagan gods who's just waiting for you to get all the right words in the right sequence. He's different. The mistake of the pagan mindset was that they thought they had a transactional relationship with God, that they provide X and then God will provide Y. So the question for us this morning is, as we think about how not to pray, is what kind of relationship are we cultivating, are we building with God? Is it transactional? When we pray, are we thinking about how we pray and are we using specific words, thinking that that's going to get kind of a higher approval rating from God? Or do we have a personal relationship with Jesus, with God? Are we having honest conversations and speaking plainly with him? Not reading from a script, not trying to fit into a mold, but telling him honestly what's going on in our lives. Tim Keller, a favorite pastor of mine, shared a story that I thought really captured this really well. He said that there's, there's two ways that we can conceive of prayer. There's thinking of God as a landlord or as a family member. Now, in the case of a landlord, you can build quite a good friendship with your landlord. You can get to know them. You can talk with them, laugh with them, share meals with them. But at the end of the day, that relationship is built on a transaction, on you paying rent, on you meeting the expectations of that relationship. And if you don't meet the expectations, things are going to get awkward. If you don't pay your landlord, you're going to be evicted. You, and this is why there's a certain amount of professional distance in positions like that, because you can't build a friendship with someone, a true lasting friendship with someone, who might let you down and you might have to evict. You might have to give bad news to some of us conceive of prayer with God like a landlord, like we are paying a certain respect, that we're using the right words, that we're using a certain way of praying, and that that is pleasing God. Now the question is, what happens when we think that we haven't done it right? What happens when we mess up? What happens when there's sin in our lives that we feel guilty and ashamed about? We're going to start reading that into God and thinking, he's going to respond to me or not respond to me based on how good my prayer is. What if I haven't kept it together this week? Can I still go to God and talk to him? Or do I have to clean that up first so that then I can get the right words and, and say the right things? But if God's a family member instead of a landlord, what difference does that make? In a family, you're free to say, whatever you want. There's not some kind of transaction that's keeping you in that relationship and keeping it going. And we know this because family members are sometimes a little too honest with us, aren't they? We're coming up on Thanksgiving this week, and I'm sure in a lot of our homes, there's some conversations that we get a little nervous about, about different things, because family members are honest with each other. We share what we really think. We share our lives together. Now, families aren't perfect, Sometimes there is hurt, sometimes there is frustration, sometimes there is dysfunction, and it can be messy, but a family can weather those things. If your relationship is not built on a transaction, but is built on a, an indissolvable commitment, like family, then you're free to speak plainly, to be honest. Do you know that God made himself your father so that you can be honest with him. He sent his son Jesus so that you could be adopted into his family so that when you speak to him, you don't need to fear him. You don't need to get the right incantation, the right words. In Psalm 139, King David says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. 
Even before word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. This is King David praying, and he recognizes from the beginning he's known by God. Something that Jesus is echoing himself here when he says, your father already knows what you need. And when you read the Psalms, when you read the prayers of people like David, you read these prayers that are messy, that are awkward, that are angry, that are frustrated. You have people who are heartbroken, lost, confused, joyful, thankful, thoughtful. In short, people who are being honest with God about what's going on in their lives. People who feel free to speak to God plainly. Because God doesn't hear you because you pray the right prayers. He hears you because God himself is good. Our prayers should start with that understanding that God, our Father, hears us, listens to us, Are you being honest with God when you speak to him or are you praying cold, empty prayers? Are you reading from a script? Do you pray about things that you have no intention of doing anything about? Sometimes we pray to God about things that he would change us and transform us and then when God brings that opportunity along, we don't do anything. That's empty babble. Those are empty prayers when we Speak to God dishonestly. Don't pray as pagans pray. Don't pray as someone who doesn't know who your father is. You can be free to speak with God plainly. Pagans think that it's about their words, but Christians know it's about our father. Which leads us to the last thing, the wrong access. If there's one thing that's standing out to you as we go through this little passage, uh, hopefully it's one word. One word that keeps coming up, Father. Jesus says, your Father who sees in secret. He says it three times in this passage. He finishes in, in verse 8, he says, don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. What makes Jesus' prayers different is who he's praying to. It's his conception of who it is who's on the other end of the line. Who is it who's picking up the call? Now, the idea that God was Father isn't actually all that new to the Jewish people at the time. There's lots of rabbis that had talked about God as Father, but never in the way that Jesus did. They'd used that word and title for him, but they didn't talk about Jehovah, Yahweh is this intimate father that loved them, that wanted to listen to them. Jesus' father, expressed in Jesus' prayers, is welcoming, attentive, gracious, merciful, empathetic, gentle, kind. He deeply values relationships, even with sinners. See, when Jesus is praying, he knows that his father wants to listen. The biggest problem that people had in Jesus' day with prayer, and I think the biggest problem for us, even in ours, it's still going on, is that sometimes we forget who the father is. We forget that prayer is only even possible because of the father. See, when we come to prayer, we're all, all of us automatically assuming a reason for our prayer. Even if it's subconsciously, we all make our prayers for God for a reason. Maybe we think that we're good people and so God is going to listen to us. Maybe that's the reason why our prayers are effective because we are good people. Maybe we think that our requests are really noble. The things that we pray about are really good. Maybe even if we're not that good, the things that we pray about are so good and so hopeful and positive that God will listen to them because he likes those things. Maybe we think that um, the issue with praying is, is that when we pray for others, God really likes that. So because we're praying a lot for others, that God will hear us. 
maybe we think that we're more in tune with God. I've read a lot of my Bible. I know a lot of the Bible and I, I spend a lot of time in church. So maybe my life is, is more in tune with God and so he will hear me. Because even though I'm not a perfect person, I've got the right things in the right places. Wrong. All of that is the wrong access for prayer. Daniel in his book says, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see that our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. The reason that you have access to God is because of God. We do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. That's what Daniel prays. He says, we pray not because we've got anything good in us, God, but because you are good, but because you are merciful. Jesus is telling us, pray because you have a father who already knows what you need who is already invested in your life, who knit you together in your mother's womb, who counted the hairs on your head, even the few that are on mine. See, too many of us view the God that we pray to like this, a judge. We imagine a God that's waiting to bring the hammer down on us, that is listening to everything that we say, waiting for us to slip up, Get it right or I'm not going to hear your prayers. It better be something worth my time. You haven't been obedient enough this week. You haven't been getting into your Bible. You haven't been serving others. I'm not interested in what you have to say. Prayer denied. Have you ever stood in front of a judge? I have, just on a couple of occasions, all for good reasons. I used to work with a non-profit organization where we would have to go into uh, court and be with our clients when the judge was speaking with them. And when you stood in front of that judge, there was this presence about him that would just fill the whole room. And you, were, you knew that you had to say the right things at the right time. And you had to say the exact things that you were supposed to say, otherwise you were going to end up in a bad situation. You're so conscious of everything you're saying because you don't want to mess up. You have this real sense that this person will not have time for you unless you get it the way that he wants you to get it. That's the way that some of us view our father. And it's a tragedy. That's how some of us think that God looks at us when we speak to him. But brothers and sisters, that's not what our father is like. Our father is like this. He walks with us. He holds us. He listens to us no matter what is going on in our life. Whether our prayers are eloquent or disheveled, Awkward, sometimes even inappropriate. He listens. Our Father delights in being with us. Jesus' warning is don't pray like people who don't know who your Father is and what He is like. Our Father has sent His Son so that we can approach Him without fear. So that we don't approach him like pagans who feel like we've got to read off a script. So that we don't approach him as a hypocrite who feel like we've got to get some kind of presentation about ourselves out. Pray as though he treasures his time with you. That he wants to be your audience. Pray as though your words matter to him. Even the uneloquent and messy ones. And pray because of his great mercy because of his rich love, and because of his endless grace. Would you guys pray with me as we close this morning? Father, I thank you that your warnings to us about how not to pray 
is your way of opening up these fears that we have within us. That you want us to approach you without fear. Well, I thank you for the blood of your son that makes it possible for a sinner like me to come near to you and for you to hear my cries. Lord, we love you. And as a church, we glorify you for being the God who listens to us and hears us. Lord, would you hear our prayers today? In Jesus' name, amen.